I was fascinated by Baltimore growing up as a kid and a teenager there, and I went away to college, but it was always my plan to come back. It was just, um, it, it took a while to convince the editors at the Sun Papers to make that possible. And after graduating in 1981, I went to Texas. My dad worked at the Morning Sun, and I couldn't get a job there for anything. And they would, at first they would say, you need more experience, you need two years experience, you need five years experience, you need this kind of experience. But then the Evening Sun had openings in uh, 1989, and I was able to get a job there. And I was so happy to be Was that even though I'm pretty frequent on social media, and I use it a lot, on Saturday, I was away from my phone and my computer almost all day because my neighborhood was having its ninth annual block party, something that, the, something that my neighbor brainstormed and a lot of us jumped in on from the first year. It's a celebration that we all look forward to. It's joyous. It's a celebration of city living. So I've lived in the city but it was only in 2002 that I moved to one of the closer to downtown neighborhoods. And I really like it. I don't own a car. It's fantastic. But when I moved into my neighborhood in South Baltimore in 2002, there were no kids. There's one kid. There's one kid, and a bus came and picked him up, took him to his private school and brought him back every day. And there were no kids because the cycle was... People in their 20s loved to live in my neighborhood because it was near fun places and it was near bars and restaurants. And but then they would have kids and they'd say, well, time to go to the suburbs. And then sort of family by family, household by household, instead of saying, well, we have to go to the suburbs, they said, we have to find a bigger house in this neighborhood, which can be a bit of a challenge. And we have to do what we can to make the schools good. And a lot of just hardworking, committed parents did what they could to bring the local schools up to a standard where now it's the exception to the rule if you send your kids to private school. Most of us are sending our kids to public schools in the neighborhood. And so now there are more and more households, families that are committed to what I call urban values. And urban values include really watching out for your neighbors, being comfortable, being in very close proximity with other people. If I yell at my kid, my neighbor hears me, and they have heard me yell at my kid. I mean, that's what row house living is all about. But I also feel loved and protected and supported in a way that I don't think I would feel in a neighborhood where houses are far, farther apart and people don't rely on one. But I certainly don't look at places that other people live and disparage them. I remember when the governor of Maryland said horrible things about the Eastern Shore. That was unacceptable. I think it's ridiculous to disparage any community anywhere. I just wouldn't do it. And my husband and I are frequently called hypocrites. Oh, you say you love Baltimore, but you live in a gated community. I was like, where did you find this? Let me show you what the view from my front door looks like. You open my front door and it's like, good morning, Baltimore. <laughs> and we love it. And I think people who love Baltimore long ago reached an understanding with the fact that you love it in spite of its problems, and perhaps you even hope that you might be able to contribute to helping with some of the problems. I'm not going to blame the media for anything. I think the media is involved in a relationship with viewers and readers. They're trying to gauge what their viewers and readers find interesting. And the media, if anything, actually has more data now because through digital media, through things that are read on the internet, whether it's the New York Times or you know, a less reputable publication, they're all collecting data on our clicks. I worked in a newspaper for a long time and people would say, you just want to sell newspapers with that headline. And it wasn't really true because the vast majority of papers we sold were subscription. 
And it didn't pay for the paper to sell an extra 100 copies at a newsstand. What paid for the paper was classified advertising and display advertising. And newsstand sales were almost just gravy. So I was very dismissive of the idea that newspapers were sold based on headlines. But nowadays, news stories are sold based on clicks. So I feel like we have a bit, of, a little bit of the case of Pogo, we have met the enemy and it is us. Our media gives us what we tell them through our own choices that we find interesting. So every time you head to that clickbaity story, you've given them information that this is what you find interesting. I have Google News and um, every now and then I go to the link that says for you, it's deeply shaming. Deeply shaming what I have told Google about my taste in news. And I have to live with that.